Well, hi there. Welcome back to the Prolific Author Podcast. I hope everyone is having a great week of writing. Uh, Before we jump into the interview, let me just say a few words. You'll probably have noticed that I've been doing a lot of interviews lately, and there is reason for that. I have been trying so hard to get uh, my academy finished up and everything, all of the technical back-end aspects of that finished, and I'm really, really close to being done. It's one of those things where I have felt like I'm three to five days away from finishing, and I felt like that for like a month. (laughs) Okay, I'm just really struggling to finish the the last few things I need to finish. And because of that, everything else is kind of taking a back seat. Um, But that's okay, because I actually do have a lot of great interviews that I recorded the end of last year, and I'm trying to get through them before the end of this year. (laughs) So it's all great. It's all good. Um, But I just want to say that in the next few weeks, I will be going back to doing more um, solo episodes and training and coaching and, and things like that. So that's coming. In the meantime, though, I really am excited for you guys to hear this interview. I'm talking with Dr. Ashley Wellman. And Dr. Wellman, she is an author. She's a children's book author, but she has been through the stuff, okay? She has had a lot of grief in her life, and she used her writing and her creativity um, not only to get herself through that grief, but also to help others. And this is something that I, I really want all of you as fiction authors to understand and to appreciate. I want you to think about why you feel a call to write. And of course, you know, we can all come up with a lot of the same answers. Of course, we want uh, to make our living this way because we love it. We want, you know, maybe the fame and notoriety of being a well-known author in the industry. Um, we love stories. We, we hear the call of these characters and these plot lines. All of that's true. But why? Why do we hear that call? Why do we love it so much? Why is this something that really, really speaks to us? Well, I'm here to tell you that whether you realize it or not, it really is probably because you want to help people on some level. So even if you're just writing um, kind of escapist stories for entertainment, and I say just, but I'm really not at all being derogatory about that. I mean, that's what I do, right? Um, (laughs) But even if it's just that and you're not, you don't think you have some higher calling like helping people who have been through trauma or been through grief, you have to understand that when you help people escape, that is helping them more than you could probably even understand in your own mind, okay? Because just getting away from the pressures and the stresses of real life and being able to escape into a fantastical world and have some sort of emotional catharsis there, that keeps people psychologically sane. It really does. This has been proven, okay? And in the world we're living in right now, right, with the pandemic and the political climate, what it is, we need that. We need that more than ever before. So don't sell yourself short by saying, oh, I just write books for entertainment. You help people in your writing. You absolutely do. And I want you to keep that in mind. And um, just really enjoy this interview from Dr. Wellman. I mean, she just drops truth bombs all over the place. Like I wrote down a whole bunch of things that she said because they were just so inspirational. We talk about how you cannot separate yourself from your writing, so don't even try. Um, (laughs) How normal it is to have doubts and you can't fail as long as you don't quit. Um, Perfection in writing is not attainable, but high quality and pride is. And I love it when she says, just do it and do it scared. You have to do it scared. Um, And then, of course, we talk about how, you know, the title for this episode, which is how self-publishing promotes confidence, grit, and freedom, which was probably my favorite part of the interview, my favorite thing I've ever heard anyone say. (laughs) So it's it's kind of how I feel about things. And of course, I'm a huge advocate for self-publishing. Totally biased over here, but that's okay, because this is my experience of it. And there's just so much truth and so much sincerity and earnestness in this interview. So I hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's jump in. Welcome to the Prolific Author Podcast. Let's face it, readers read fiction to feel emotion and be transported and transformed. In this ongoing digital revolution, where online marketing is always in flux, the only way to create a sustainable author business and live off your royalties is to write transformational stories, market at every stage of the author journey, and cultivate a loyal audience of readers. Fortunately, there's never been more opportunity to make a living as a fiction author. Hi, I'm Lisa Hill. USA Today best-selling author and story clarity coach. When I'm not dictating my own stories about dragons, serial killers, and dystopian worlds, I help other authors write their own transformational fiction, position them as bestsellers, and market them like pros. Join me on the podcast where I give writing tips, marketing how-tos, story advice, and interviews with other authors who are in the trenches just like you and making it work. We are prolific authors. All right. <laughs> we are here today with Ashley Wellman. How are you today, Ashley? 
I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you're here. Um, so you are an author and you used to be a criminologist, which is super exciting. So why don't you start by telling us who you are and what you do and what you write? Yeah. So had you asked me that two years ago, I would have told you the only titles that I had were Dr. Ashley Wellman, criminologist and victimologist. And so my career has been as a professor, which I still am right now, but as a professor, and I've been an advocate for families impacted by unsolved murders. And, and that passion has been to really make sure my students um, understand how their acts in, the, in their profession really do impact such a bigger picture than what they understand. So mm -hmm. it's crazy that today I'm sitting here and I'm saying, okay, someone who studied murder, <laughs> now I'm a children's book author. So <laughs> it's been a really cool transition and, um, and it's, it's been something that I needed. My husband unexpectedly passed away in 2018. Mm, I'm sorry. And thank you. And in that moment, there was just such a need for something new and something creative and beautiful. And so that's what writing's really become for me. And now I'm thinking this doesn't have to be something that's just a hobby or just a project. This can be a career. And so that's where I'm at right now is exploring those new adventures as Ashley the writer and not necessarily just Dr. Ashley Wellman, the criminologist. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so did you do any writing before you transitioned? Yeah, so I've always been creative. Okay. I've, I've always loved um, creating, painting, theater, all of those things. And as a scholar, that's what we do, we write. And so it was interesting because I was trained in my graduate program to be a writer, but to be mm. a scientific writer. Right. And so, you know, I have, I don't know, 35 academic publications and chapters and books and all of these things on my research. But in those moments of grief, I started realizing that, that what I used to crave so badly, that creative part of me, I could now take something I knew I was good at, which was writing, but cold writing, and maybe bring back some of that magic into creative writing. And it was, it was weird. I don't know if you've experienced this as a fellow writer, but when you're in the zone, the world comes alive. You right. get transported, like not just the readers, the writer yes. gets transported into these stories. You start envisioning things like your book signing and reading to a <laughs> child and all of these things. And so it, it really became such a way for me to just put color back into not just my life, but into my daughter's life. She um, was four when her daddy passed away. She's mm -hmm. six now. And I've, I've included her on every aspect of, uh, I'm a self-published author, so mm -hmm. I like to say indie author, but I included her on everything from making sure illustrations were, you know, things that excited her, picking fonts, having her test the protocols with me, ordering, you know, fulfilling orders right. in my home. It was just really cool. So now I have this little CEO who's working alongside <laughs> me in the process. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice that you got to, they get to work with her and, and teach her this stuff. Oh, it's so fun. And you can sense this entrepreneurial spirit. Like she'll meet people in the store and she'll say, oh yeah, my mom wrote a book. You need to order it on our website. <laughs> I'm going, oh my gosh, it's so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they, at that age, they haven't really developed our um, nervousness about selling. No. So they just don't have the filter and that, that can be a good thing in, the, in that works. case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, how, how do you think, I mean, to get, kind of get into the deeper nitty gritty in terms, especially of the emotion, you know, you've dealt with grief a lot and the psychology, how is that translating over into your author career now? Yeah. So it, I didn't know that it was, I really thought it was a personal endeavor and then people are just going to enjoy this whimsical book. Right. And so my first children's book is The Girl Who Dances with Skeletons, My Friend Fresno. And it's this fun, sweet book about a little girl, Reagan, my daughter, and her best friend Fresno, her posable skeleton. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I'm going to make her, I, I had promised my husband when I kissed him goodbye, I'm going to make her a magical wife. And so I thought if I put her into this children's book, that's going to be the spark of magic. That's going to be the start. But the story is really one of love and friendship and acceptance and inclusivity. And the purpose of writing it was so Reagan would have this piece to say, yes, my dad passed away, but I'm not broken because I'm not like everybody else. It's just mm -hmm. something that makes me different. And in some ways that makes me magical and special because she's developed skills that she didn't know she had or didn't need without having experienced that kind of trauma. 
Right. But what I, yeah, but what I didn't know was that as I shared this story with people, I started getting calls from a group about intellectual disabilities. And they said, when we read this book, we saw our children with special needs in Fresno because he's not accepted and he learns to love himself by someone being kind to him. Mm. But we also saw our older kids or our younger kids with, that, that are, you know, do not have special needs in Reagan. So being that support person and what Reagan learned and what Reagan grew from because she was able to help her friend. And so I thought, okay, that was not the purpose of this book. And you found strength and purpose in this little story. And same thing with other grieving children, same thing with kids who were being bullied. And so what I've been able to do is really take that advocate that I've been as a scholar and mm -hmm. say, I can do talks with counselors and grief experts and trauma experts. And I can teach them how to use this book with parents and with kiddos to really start really tough conversations, right? Mm -hmm. that things that scare us. That's one of the lines in the book. Things that scare us are often just misunderstood. And so we've even been able to contact schools and talk about things like race and, um, you know, uh, different political beliefs, all these things that in 2020 and 2021 have been so polarizing, right? That those really bring us together. And so nuts, how original ideas or purposes of what we write can really transcend into things we never imagined. Mm -hmm. And that's just the start. Then you get to go like, okay, now what am I creating next? Because that legacy is in motion. And you right. start to create new stories and new things that you can put into the world. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And I think that's what's so beautiful about art, but especially writing. Obviously, we're a little bit biased toward the writing um, because I think we, you know, we're all human and we all have the same human emotions and just obviously different experiences. But I think like we wouldn't think that bullying would end up creating the same emotions as like death or losing a parent. But they really do, but they do at the core. You yes, know? because all of us want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. We all want to fit in, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think when any kind of trauma, any kind of hurt enters into who we are, right? It makes us question all kinds of things, our worth, our ability to be loved, all of those questions. Mm -hmm. And so it really is. At the end of the day, I used my survivors, you know, like what I used to counsel homicide survivors in, sexual assault survivors in. I use that in my own grief journey. And I'm uh, you know, the result of a natural death. My husband died of a pulmonary embolism. Mm. And so it was like, wait, but we're all struggling with those same fears and those same you know, concerns and those same desperate moments. And right. kids do the same thing, right? Kids, str they strive and they, they want to be loved and accepted. And I don't think we stop being like that as we get older. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and I have to ask, I hope this doesn't weird you out or anything, but when I first hear, heard what you did and then the, the title of your book, how much of you is in it? Because it almost feels like because you dealt with grief and murder victims, you could be the girl who danced with skeletons and was accepting. So you know what's crazy is that I, I so my own my very first podcast I ever did, the girl said, okay, so you're Fresno. And I said, no. <laughs> because really, if you do think about it, I might be like Reagan, you know, in this. Story. Right. And she said, no, 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 because I, I also, so right after my husband's death, I had a career setback at work because grief complicates your return and your place in the world. And so I had right. had a, tr a devastating career moment right after the death of my husband. Mm. So it was like these compounding things and really feeling like you never say how much worse can it get, but like, I really felt <laughs> so down and, and so buried mm -hmm. underneath my grief and trauma and loss and everything else. And she said, but you're Fresno because once you get stripped to the bones, you also get this chance to create beautiful things and to learn mm -hmm. beautiful things about yourself and to discover who you are. And she's like, that's what Fresno does in this book. He's bare bones. He's all out there. He's you know, like, he's willing to learn and be loved and he fights for friendship and those kinds of things. And, he, and she said, that's you. And I thought, Oh my God. So maybe <laughs> unconsciously, <laughs> I might be a little bit of Reagan, but I also might be a little bit of Fresno too. And really yeah. discovering yourself with, because I didn't do any of the successes I've had since his death are not just a result of my resilience. It's a tribe of people who didn't stop loving me when I wasn't mm -hmm. lovable and, you know, didn't stop fighting for me when I didn't know how to fight for myself. And so that's Reagan in the book is my tribe and maybe I'm Fresno. And then 
you know, when I have the strength to advocate for others, then maybe I become Reagan. So I think, I think we definitely put a lot of ourselves in there, but yeah, yeah. That original purpose was my daughter is going to have a starring role in a kid's book. And then now I look back and I go, well, there might've been a whole lot of subconscious right. you know, things <laughs> going on there. Absolutely. I always think it's funny when authors talk about how you know, they, they purposely try not to put themselves in their characters. Usually their first books they do, yeah. but then they try to distance. And I'm going, well, I mean, that's fine. You may not have the same personality, but you're always going to be in there because yeah. it's coming from you. you yeah. Know? And, and our, our take of it, everything's always through um, our lens, you know? So yeah. it's neat because uh, in research, right, we're supposed to stay out of the conversation. And I remember uh -huh. when I used to work with, uh, more I still do, but when I work with homicide survivors, all of my advisors in grad school and all would say, Ash, do not, do not put yourself in this research at all. And I thought, how do you do that? How do you hold a mother's hand and have her cry and not re be reflexive in that, right? right? And so it's funny because everything I write, I make sure I say, this is through my lens. This is my interpretation of these stories because you cannot separate yourself from yeah writing from storytelling which is what I did as a scholar too mm -hmm. and so yeah I'm like why remove yourself doesn't that make it that's what makes it so cool is that you're opening somebody's heart you're opening somebody's mind and right. you're getting to read along with them and so yeah I'm in there I'm surely in there <laughs> <laughs> well that's like you said that's just how we connect with each other so there's really no sense in trying yeah. to pull back from that don't you deny know? it if you're writing don't deny it you're allowed to be part of the story and you're allowed right. to put your it's your voice so yeah. yeah definitely definitely I agree so can you tell us um kind of what the process was that you did with your daughter to get the book you know from start to finish and all published yeah absolutely so one of the biggest things that I I, I guarantee you a lot of people are thinking about is do I do that self-published or traditional publishing because uh -huh. For, um, I, I used to be a Barnes and Noble manager. I was a community relations manager. And I remember back in 2004, when I started working there, there was such a stigma about self-published authors, right? Because yeah. anybody can publish anything they want. True. There's definitely bad self-published books. And yes. there's also beautiful self-published books. Mm -hmm. And there's some crap traditionally published stuff too. Everyone right. <laughs> knows it. <laughs> Everyone knows the, the bad purchase you made at, at Books A Million or Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm. but, um, but for me, as I was starting to create this story, I had a very dear friend in the middle of my grief say, you've got to focus on something else right now. And you've got to do something that's lighthearted and that you know like gives you an outlet. So write about Reagan and her best friend, Fresno, the skeleton. So I did, I just started writing. For me, I write in spurts, right? I don't mm -hmm. write, um, I'm not the person who says like, oh, commit 15 minutes a day, you'll write for an hour and you know, all these other things. I write three books in a week and then I don't mm -hmm. write for eight months, you know? So <laughs> it's like, I'll just wake up one day and I'm like, I got the story, I gotta write this down. And right. then I kind of get stunted. And so I wrote this book very quickly. I got connected with Zachary Thomas Kincaid, who is Thomas Kincaid's nephew, so the painter of light. I got connected with his nephew, who's a phenomenal artist. Yes. And um, yeah, and so I said, hey, I've got this story. I'd love you to, to illustrate it for me. He's like, all right. Um, <laughs> and, and from the start, he and I had that debate. Is, should we go traditional or should we go self-publish? And it ultimately came down to, I said, Zach, I need this. I need this. I need control over this book. I need a avenue to have a different kind of passion in my life. I want to put the 12 different people you would get with the traditional publishing company, right? I want to do the marketing. I want to do the sales. I want to do these things. And I said, I need the purpose. Like I need that. And he mm -hmm. said, all right, well, I'm going <laughs> to take it away. Right. He's an introvert. So he was like, good luck. You do that. <laughs> So, um, so is that did, why he didn't want to do, like he wanted to do traditional because he's an introvert and he wanted I think so. I think so. It. And I think, I think it's, it's in some ways it's safer to, to fight yeah. for that traditional thing because it does take a lot of money. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of different skills to say, sure. I'm going to successfully self publish. And I didn't just self publish. I ordered 10,000 copies of the book. I have 2,500 plush dolls. I have puzzles. I got, I went all in. Yeah. And I said, I'm just going to literally kind of be my own retailer and wholesaler and really push this book that way. And so um, for me, I said, I am an extrovert. I have a background in PR. I'm, I'm craving a new path. And so it made sense for me to say, I'm going to have ownership of this with Zach as this incredible business partner. 
and I'm, I'm going to get creative and make it work. And so for me, I got online. I started researching everything I could about what I needed to pay attention to, like what, how thick I wanted pages to be, how um, thick I wanted the cover board to be. Did I want a dust jacket? Did I want, you know, what kind of seaming did I want in the book? And mm -hmm. so I then went and sat with Zach. It was so fun <laughs> in a children's book department multiple times and kept opening books and feeling. And I mean, people must have thought we were nuts, but I said, feel this one, <laughs> touch this one, hold this one. Like, what size do you want? You know? Yeah. And we were making all of these decisions, graphic design layout, everything on our, on our own. We we're sitting there with scrap paper and a pen in a children's department, brainstorming these things. And so I found a company in China. And I said, this is what I want. I want this thick. I want this, you know, quality. I want all of this. And um, we started the process of saying, well, then submit Zach's work. And here's a proof of what you're going to order. And um, I thought in my head, this is going to be quick, right? I finished the book, I think, <laughs> on October. Yeah, you laughed because you knew. Yeah. <laughs> October 2018, I had handed Zach the contract and illustration uh, request and those kinds of things. And um I did not have the truck back into my driveway until October of 2020 of last year. Wow. So it was a two year commitment. I mean, yes, all of us know we had COVID that interfered with things. There was China right. trade issues, all kinds of stuff that said like, you know, and every setback, I started with burn it all down. I made a huge mistake. This was a really stupid investment. <laughs> and then 30 minutes later, I could calm down. And I could say in this moment when I'm delayed, what else could I be doing? Set up your website, get your social media going, create a plush doll, make puzzles, right? So, so in hindsight, some of those delays allowed me to do exactly what I wanted to do with my book, which was create a brand. The book was mm -hmm. just the start. I really said like, I want a brand. So Ray of Sunshine is my publishing name, you know? Yeah. After my daughter, R-E-A, Reagan. Oh, nice. So, yeah. And so I was like, okay, so I'm going to really work on that and I'm gonna work on the second and third Fresno book. And I'm gonna think about other illustrators that I wanna partner with for other storylines. And so in the struggles, you know, Reagan will tell you one time she, uh, I got a proof and she's the, the lady in China said, this is it. Like, this is what it's gonna look like, you know? And uh, this was, I think the third proof I had gotten. Uh -huh. And I remember I drove 50 minutes to the FedEx plant because I had missed the delivery. So I drove 50 minutes <laughs> to go find the truck and get this book because I wanted it so badly to see what it was. Right. I open it in the car and it is not what I was expecting. The pages oh no. were really thin. I could see the thread that had sewn it together. The colors were different than what I had seen in the other proofs, right? They were like a bolder, brighter color on all the pages. And I literally had a nervous breakdown. And my daughter's oh, like, no. mama, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. You know, it's like a <laughs> six year old in the back seat. Like it's so, stop mama, you did that. It's beautiful. And I'm like, in my head, you know, I'm like, I'm done. I am completely done with this. <laughs> so I, I come home, I'm in tears. One of my dear friends came over to calm me down and he said, send Reagan to bed, let her be, do not do this in front of her, right? Let her be. And then I came back down he's like, it's gorgeous, Ash. And he's like, I think this is a... All she wants to do is make sure all the words are where they need to be, that everything's spaced the right way. Mm. Email her and ask her. And sure enough, she was like, that's not the quality page we're sending you. That's not the scene uh. we're doing. That is the accurate color because that's on the, the machine that's going to print on that book before I was sending you a, a, a weaker print resolution, you know? Oh, okay. So she's like, yes, the colors are different. So uh, literally all that stress, all that it's not right <laughs> was for nothing. But there, <laughs> that's just one example of like the million times in two years that I thought, I don't know that I should be doing this. I don't mm -hmm. know that I made the right decision. I don't know that this was smart to invest in this. And, and I think that's a, a normal struggle. So for anyone yeah. listening, I yeah. think those doubts, as long as you don't listen to yourself, <laughs> Right. The, the, the doubts are so normal. And I think it makes you human to say, I've got to feel those feels. And then I have to go back and remember, why am I doing this? Do I believe in this? And if I believe in it, I just got to every day make a conscious effort to really fight for what I believe in. Mm -hmm. And it's going to work. And, and work means that, that you, you know, I think success, like my, my mom has, has said before, like, what happens if this doesn't work? Or, you know, yeah. you know and I said, 
well, I wrote the book. I published the book. I don't know how many people I've talked to that are like, oh, I'm going to write a book one day. I'm going to do that, right? It's out in the universe. My grandbabies are going to hold it one day. You know, my, <laughs> my daughter is right. always a children's book character. And I'm, I'm doing what I needed to do. It's, it's, it's doing its purpose right now. I don't expect to be a New York Times bestseller. I, w- I don't expect to be, you know, like this award-winning author. But I do, I do celebrate that I've done it, that I'm passionate about it, that I'm getting to share it one-on-one. That's the most powerful connection that you can do. The moment a child opens that book and you see them laugh or you see them smile or you see them hug your plush doll, it's like, it's mind blowing (laughs) what that does for you as a human being. It's amazing. Right. Right. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I I was going to say, I, I can think of three major endeavors I've had in my life. Two of them were around writing. One was more entrepreneurial. One was just my writing and one was more hobbyish. And I, I think every single one of those for the first year, if not two, I was just riddled with doubts and not knowing if it was going to work out. So I, I'm glad that you said that. I think that is a hundred percent normal. And the only way to get those doubts to go away is to keep at it. Yeah, you keep know? going. You don't fail if you don't stop. So it's like, you know, and, and, and the, when you do it, you can take failure off the table. Maybe it's not going to be this long-term endeavor, you know, but you uh-huh. did it. It's like, you did that. So the moment right. you hold that thing in your hand that you created, that is a magical accomplishment in and of itself. And the, the, every hand that gets to touch that book, that's amazing because you don't know what kind of impact that's going to have on that given person. And right. that might be all that it is, you know, like it might be a one or two year project, or it might be something that, you know, I order another 10,000 in five years, who knows, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's so not about that. And I think when I can remind myself, that is not what this is about. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I need the money because I'm a single mom and this is a business endeavor, but right. that's so not why I started it. Mm-hmm. And I, when I remind myself the beauty that's not only contained in my own family, but that I'm trying to share, you get re-energized, right? But yeah. it doesn't mean that those mountains, that those fears, that those doubts, that those, you know, like anxious moments don't, don't make you question yourself. That's, that's just part of being, I think, human and, and being brave enough to take that risk to try something that you may not have ever done before. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think your art, I think if, um, and we kind of see this anyway in business, if someone's doing it just for the money and there's no passion in it, it's not going to last. They're not no. going to be able to sustain it. But I think you almost have to do it for yourself first. And yeah. by doing that, kind of by extension, that's how you're going to hit other people. But you have to do yeah. it for yourself first. Yeah, I absolutely think so. And I think people love being a part of something that is, that matters, yeah. you know, like it, it's, it's powerful to get to say, oh, like I, I understand to an extent the struggle you might be facing. Can I tell you how this book has like helped my child? Do you know what I mean? Right. Can I tell you why my heart wrote this and what it might be able to do for you? And those kinds of things. I mean, it's genuine human connection. Yes. And that's the kind of the cool thing about um, being that kind of not only just the self-published, but this, this brand owner is that I do get to say, Ash, if it's going to, if it's going to mo- make movement, it's because of you. And if it doesn't, it's because of you. And so I get to take that kind of control and I get to seek out those opportunities that maximize who I get to help, what story times I can do, right? What kids I can connect with. And it's just, it's a lot and it's a lot of joy too. So it's, it's that balance of, of that reminder, like you said, though, reminding yourself, this is why I did this. This is why it's important. And then I do believe the money counts because I think people can feel that and they want to yeah. be a piece of that. Right. I agree. I agree. And maybe this is a kind of a footnote compared to what we've been talking about, but the fact that you did it all yourself, that you did pick out the stitching and the binding and the pages, I mean, it's just going to mean that much more to you, right? Yes. At which, the might end, then... be, which might justify my mental breakdown about what I do, <laughs> you know, because it's like you do. And, and I think if, if you have the personality like me, I'm a type A OCD overachiever, you know, uh-huh. and, and it's this, it's reminding myself that in art perfection is not necessarily obtainable, that it's. Right. High quality and pride is what you go for. And you say, yeah. you know, I remember I took pictures of those, those two different pages, you know, the, the proof and then the proof number two. And I kept sending them to friends and I'm like, look at the difference of this. This looks horrible. Look at the difference. And they're all like, am I supposed to be seeing a difference? Like, what are you talking about? You know, and <laughs> I was so ingrained in the details that I had to set it down and I literally left it for two days and I came back and I, I remember I was crying. And I said, it is beautiful, right? Like I was talking to another friend, you know, and they said, Ash, uh-huh. it's, it's amazing. 
you know, and they say, yeah. you're so deep in the details. They're mm-hmm. like, I don't know what the first, they're like, I can't tell the difference side by side, but if I could, I didn't know what the first page looked like. So now to see it in these bold colors, it's gorgeous. You know, like let it be, unless something's wrong, right? I right. knew there were no errors grammatically because I had that edited up and down, up and down, up and down. I knew that it was beautiful because Zach is a beast of an artist. He is just a beautiful artist. Uh-huh. And so I had to finally say, Ash, you got to trust yourself. It is mm-hmm. high quality. You made every decision you could to make it a beautiful book time to let it go into the world. And I think that might've been where the fear came from too, allowing someone else to read it because as much as anyone fights it, this was a kid's book. I was scared of what if people don't like it, you know? Right. And um, I'm writing a teen novel with a friend. Um, we are doing a, a trilogy and we shared it with beta readers. And I remember that, I mean, it was like a sick phobia that generated inside my body of saying like, we worked on this project for a year. It is 380 pages that we did, which is a lot of work. And I thought now we're going to get 10 people to tell us what they think. Like they might hate it. And it took, it took uh, a lot of patience with myself to say like, there's actually so much excitement in people who might have a different viewpoint, who might have advice, who might have um, you know, all of these different thoughts about your works, but then you also learn things that you never thought were going to inspire them. You never thought were going to be their favorite parts, characters that you never thought they were going to fall in love with. Right. And you hear that you don't just hear the bad, you hear all these amazing things. And then as the author, you get to decide how, when, and to what extent you integrate your fans, your friends, all everybody's thoughts. So we have a better book today that we're shopping with a traditional agent because that book, I don't think I have the energy to do by myself. <laughs> but, but, but we have such a better book today because we, we allowed people into our hearts and our minds to really look at that book. And we trusted them to care enough to give us honest feedback. And they did. And it made it better. Right. Mm-hmm. right. But it's scary. Very scary. Even, even reading Fresno to people. I'm, at first, I was like, oh, I hope they like it. You know, and now I'm just excited to share it with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's important, too, to note that everybody feels that feel fear and the more you it can really build if you feed it but once you get it out there like because I've done that lots of times too where I was just mortified to do something and then once I did it once or twice I was like oh okay I'm good now you know great it's great it's but it's a learning process because like this was new to me you know I'm used to um I'm used to academic writing and and we have horrific review processes you know where people (laughs) write back and like this is crap and no merit and and you kind of get used to that but it's so different because it's it's dry and it's scholarly and it's these kinds of things Mm -hmm. but with something that's this creative little beast that you grew by yourself you know that's your baby and so it was it was a learning process and now it is every time you do it every time I make a decision it's getting easier and easier and easier to be confident in those decisions and to do it yeah yeah and I think that's super important for people to understand so yeah thanks for saying that of course yeah absolutely do it and Um, do it scared that's always my advice do it and do it scared because yeah. you're never going to be, you're never going to be in the place to start a project confident. Trust me, right. do it and well, do it scared. And there was nothing in the history of the world worth doing that didn't have obstacles and wasn't hard work and didn't take a long time. And, you know, it's just, if it's too easy, it's probably not going to take off and be what you want it to be. So absolutely. Absolutely. And there's, there really is like, you can look at, I think we look at people, you always see that meme or the, the picture where it's the um, iceberg, you know, and then it's like, all these things under the surface or the right. little duck swimming across the surface. And there's, you know, he's pedaling so fast underneath. Everyone presents this ease and this beauty. And I try even like with my own grief story, I'm like, it is not pretty. I present mm-hmm. pretty. <laughs> you know what I, mean? like, I will present it, but I want to remind people that there are also really ugly, really dark, really challenging times in, in life in anything you do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's important. I think it's important to remind each other, like I've been rejected from 32 agents but I'm going to keep trying because maybe number 100, you know, like you got to remind people that no one hits it on their first time. No one is perfect their first time out the gate and you keep going because your legacy starts to build and you start to really establish not only internally, but like with your, with your readers who you are. So you got to just keep plugging along. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. So switching gears a little bit, since you got the books delivered and you have them all now, how are you getting it out into the world? Okay, so I have my website. So it's myfriendfresno.com. That has been our greatest 
source of connecting with people through social media, referring them to our website. They get to visit our Bone Boutique, which is our <laughs> online store, and, and are able to get things like the book, the plush doll, the puzzles, those types of things. Um, so the website has been the greatest resource during COVID. I will tell you, um, I went to, um, you know, a vendor fair and it was crazy amazing to be able to be face to face with people and say, can, Hey, can I grab you for a second? I want to tell you about my story and watching the, that human connection I talked to you about, uh-huh. that's, what's really hard during COVID and being, uh, kind of an online only brand. And, uh-huh. um, it's been a little bit of a challenge because I only have the, the four types of products. Right. And so as you grow, you're able to promote more and more and more and attract people with new things. And so that's why we're working right now on really growing that, you know, illustrate different illustrators doing different books with me and Zach working on his second book and a coloring book. But we've done things like virtual story times. Um, I've done things with uh, nonprofits and doing fundraisers with them and kicking back, you know, 25% of sales to the school, which makes me feel really proud as an author and someone who's an educator. Um, uh-huh doing things like that, working with galleries and asking them to carry the book and um, haven't been out to indie bookstores and things like that, but because I'm a, I'm a hermit and I stay inside during COVID, but, um, but that's, that's my goal. When, before COVID hit, the goal was I'm going to go and I'm going to show and I'm going to tell my story and I'm going to ask them to carry my book and I'm going to ask them to buy 10 copies and those kinds of things. So yeah. when COVID lifts, I want to be looking at, you know, children's boutiques and galleries that carry Kincaid art because Zach is part of that, you know, that legacy right. And, right. Um, and, and more groups like that. And I think it does. It takes p- feet on the ground and, and sharing yeah. your story and getting people to have an affinity, not just for your product, but for you. Because mm-hmm. like I said, sometimes people aren't really investing in or are really supporting just the product. It's right. oftentimes like, I like her. I see her mission. I want to be part of her story. And okay. they and they they build that with you. And so I think the more vulnerable you can be, the more you can put yourself out there, the more that you can have FaceTime with buyers, with with you know, schools, with whatever, the better that your brand becomes, the better your product does. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's something that a lot of authors struggle with because they're they tend to be introverted. We all know this, you know, and we don't want to get on the phone with people. And because I'm assuming to get to talk to the galleries, did you just call them up and speak with them yeah. pretty much? Yeah. yeah. That's and really what it takes. It's really scary, you know, yeah. and you gotta, you gotta know like, okay. And you know, I had to work on my PR pitch of like, okay, you got, you know, 30 seconds to convince them that they need to listen, or can I email over an ebook copy so you can see what you're going to get. And I've made marketing worksheets and all kinds of things about wholesaling and, you know, these different, different uh, ideas that I can share directly with people. Mm-hmm. So, it, there's a lot of work and a lot of investment on the back end to say, I'm prepared, I'm ready, I have the materials that I'm going to go out and I'm going to ask people to fall in love with our book and, yeah. and to carry it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I love that because I think um, I think this kind of this sort of thing is really missing in a lot of ways from the author mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. It, learning to be entrepreneurial, and I know that it's a skill, like we've talked about. You've got to do it a few times and, and deal with the fear, and then you'll get used to it. But being prepared in that way, creating these materials and knowing what you're going to say, that helps alleviate a lot of the fear, I think. Isn't it crazy that I, in college, I was a public relations person. Then I went full circle, right, and, <laughs> and became this criminologist academic for the last, I don't know, um, you know, 13 years. That's what I've uh-huh. been doing. And then trauma hits. And I go back to my roots. I go back yeah. to that creative girl. I go back to the girl who fell in love with books. I'm it's, it's weird how you can look back in your past and be like, maybe that's not a skill that I've been using recently, or maybe that's not what my job title is, but I've done that before. You're like, wait a minute. I've had to do that before. I applied to college. I, you know, I do this. <laughs> right. I marketed myself before. So you, you can think back. Like, I think a lot of people don't think they have those skills and it's mm-hmm. not that it's that you don't, you've never defined that as right. your skill and you haven't ever been forced to do that. We're all capable of it. It's yeah. just, um, I do think I benefit from being a hyperactive extrovert and I, you know, and I'm a yeah. people person and I, I char, I get charged up by other people. Um, I think that's a blessing and that might be why self-publishing route was good for me. Yeah. Whereas I think there's definitely people, I was on a panel with uh, traditionally published authors and they were like, you exhaust me just sitting next to you because they're like that, but I know that's the personality you need to make it work. And they're like, that's why I went traditional. I could not 
be my own marketer. I could not be my own PR person. I could not be my own layout person. I could not do this. And they said, so they said it takes a type, you know, this is like other people that are like, you're like, it doesn't, not all of us want to or can. (laughs) Right. Right. Well, and I would even argue though, that I don't know that I agree that there's a type. I think that's what people think, Yeah, you know, Um, but just like what you said, I think we're all capable of it. I I mean, of course, some people don't want to. And of course, that's a personal decision. I think that's what this panel was more. I think they looked at me and went like, I don't want to have to do all. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, because it is. It's a lot more work, but it's also like anything. It's a lot more work, but it's a lot more rewarding, not only financially, but yeah in terms of your creativity and your independence and Absolutely. belief in yourself and all of that. Yes. And, and just like what you do, you have this ownership of it. And like I yes. said, there's some kind of power in saying, if it doesn't work, that's on me, but if it succeeds, it's on me too. And right. it really does that like, keeps you grounded in this, in this path forward. It's really, really a fascinating kind of even mm-hmm. psychological thing, you know, where it's like you, it's yeah. on you girl, let's do this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, and I think it promotes, freedom and independence a lot because you can't first of all you can't blame anyone else you got to figure it out right and number two nobody's coming to save you so you got to figure it out you know what I mean it it just builds grit it builds this determination and this this excitement and then and then it does it creates almost like this addiction where I'm like I want to do this again I need to do Uh this and I need to do this and um you, you you start I've just started dreaming again in these ways where it's like, slow down, Ash, you've got so much to do, <laughs> you know, but you really do start to envision what that world can look like when you, when you let yourself say, this is mine. So what right. do you want that to be, Ash? It can be anything. We can be anything we want to be. Mm-hmm. What is, what is that? And there, that is the scariest question, right? What do you want this to be? What do you want to be? But then God, it's liberating. Yeah. It's so liberating to be like, oh, let's do it. Let's try. Let's just try and see what happens. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really beautiful. I, I'm so glad that you're dreaming again. And I just want to say that I, that I love the idea that, that self-publishing your writing can, can save you in that way. Like, yes. because I, I mean, I'm totally biased being a self-published author yes. too, but it's just, that's what I kind of live for is that kind of story, you know? Yeah, it, it, it really was. And it started as a way to survive trauma. And then it said, wait, this can heal me. And now it's not just that, it's a way to thrive. And it's a way to rediscover and give myself permission to be somebody renewed, right? I'm not, I'm always gonna be Ashley. I'm always a scholar, I'm always academic. But I also can say like, Ash, you're allowed to have a new adventure. You lost the life you thought you were gonna have, but you're allowed to have a new adventure. And my husband, Buddy, is the first one up in heaven sitting on the front row going like, hell yes, girl, like, this is the craziest, <laughs> coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Because he doesn't want me to struggle or be forced back into a box I don't fit in anymore. So that permission, I think, to say, you can try this, you can try something new, was something in and of itself that was like healing and revolutionary in you know, my whole life. Yeah. Right, right. That's wonderful. So that's a good segue. Uh, Tell us, you already said you've got lots of books you're working on. So tell us what future projects you have coming out. Oh my gosh. Okay. So that ghost book, we're trying to get it, uh, the trilogy, we're trying to get that placed for the young adult um, market with a traditional publisher, but self-publishing, I'm currently working on books two and three of Fresno. So Fresno's first Christmas and Fresno finds his heart. So those are working on the Fresno line. I have a little book about a girl named Trixie, who's a complete quirk. She's so fun. (laughs) She's so different. And yet she realizes you don't have to change for anybody, right? You can, you can be different and you can be bold and stand out and not be apologetic about that. So Mm -hmm. I like her character. She's, that's me. (laughs) That's me. (laughs) Because you, you, if you operate in kindness and authenticity and vulnerability, you don't have to make apologies when other people don't understand that, right? As long as your, your heart is pure and you're doing it with good intentions, you be you. You be you. So that's like her book. Um, and then I found two other illustrators that I'm working with overseas, which has been really cool. Connecting with with young up and coming artists and giving them an opportunity to put their work. I mean, like I cried the other night talking to this illustrator. She said, oh my God, you do not know what kind of opportunity you're giving me by allowing me to illustrate this book. You know what I said? I'm, I can't promise financial. I cannot promise any of that. And she's like, I don't care to be able to put my work on paper and to have somebody see it. She's like, thank you for this, it's a big deal. And so Uh, um, I'm working with her on um, a kid's ghost book. It's very (laughs) cute, it's very cute. They're fun ghosts. And um, another girl with more of the classic uh, fairy tale adventures. So um, tons of, it's it's weird because 
three months ago, I kept being like, you know, Zach and I are going to do Fresno. And then I said, well, Zach and I are going to do Fresno. And then I'm going to build what I, what I said I was going to build. I'm going to build Ray of Sunshine out and have multiple partnerships with incredible artists and allow myself to really do these different stories and build that company out. Yeah. And now you're living the dream. Oh my gosh. I'm not yet. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it. It's, it's, and it's really as cool. The, 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 the small pieces and oh, this is another tip for anyone who's listening. If I do, I'm going to yeah. give another a tip. Stop waiting for that end result to celebrate things. So I'm learning um, that little things are worth celebrating. That call with that illustrator, nothing has happened. But she said, this is amazing. This is a big opportunity for me. And I got off that call and I did, I cried. And I said like, this is a big deal. I did like, we did that. This is going to be a project we're doing. I celebrated even the idea happening. And then with yeah. another, you know, with another project, I, I had edited the words and I sent it to another, another girl. And I said, here it is. What do you think? And I, I celebrated a mini celebration, you know, that I said, mm -hmm. huh, you sent her an edited version of that manuscript. That's a big deal. Because at first I would only allow myself to celebrate when the product was done and that was exhausting. But now yeah. that I'm learning to celebrate those milestones, those moments within the process, oh my God, it's so much more fun. It's so much more fun. And it, it alleviates stress when things get stressful. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, that's okay because I'm going to get to celebrate in like three days when something good happens. Right. And so, right. so take those moments not the product, not the finished thing. Take the moments and remember that those are really cool too. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being here and talking to us today. It's been such a joy to talk to you. Thank you so much. For it's your been story. a blessing. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for the work you do to celebrate self-published <laughs> authors and to keep encouraging people to put themselves out there because there's a lot of magic we hold inside of us. So sharing, it's really cool. I agree. I completely agree. Is there anything else you want to say to up and coming authors who are still trying to figure it out. I would just say, like I said, do it scared. Just do it and put yourself out there because there's never the right time. There's never the right opportunity. You can create the world you envision by putting it out there and risking a little bit just to, to fulfill this dream that you have. So if you're capable, take the risk on yourself. Thank you. Of course. Thank you for giving us such a, such a, an inspirational, uh, thank you interview. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd love anyone who wants to follow our wacky adventure right now. You can follow us on social media at my friend Fresno. We're on all of the major social media networks. And then you can jump on our website and play with us there too at myfriendfresno.com. Great. Great. I will make sure to link those in the show notes. So that Yay. People can find Thank you. you. Absolutely. Thanks again for being here. Of course. Thanks for having me. Me again. Before you go, if you found value in this episode, I would love it if you could leave me a review. Reviews are the best way to show your appreciation and help others find this podcast. Be sure to screenshot it, share it on your favorite social media network, and tag me at LK Hill Books. Remember, the world needs your stories. Only you can change someone's heart with your fire-breathing dragons, your mind-blowing mysteries, your epic romances, and your intense thrillers. So join the revolution and be a prolific author.